Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. All right, guys. One of the recommendeds from Discord. A happy birthday to you, Lightx7. Um, uh, not that you recommended this, but you were getting on my ass, uh, rightfully so, um, about doing more, all of my marshals getting on me, uh, for doing more of the recommendeds over there after I finish some of the series episodes I'm doing. So let's do it. I just, I like learning about ships. That's why I have this thing. I like these pictures, diagrams, whatever. Hope y'all are doing well. If not, that sucks. He'll be good soon. Don't worry. I do mean that. I know the more I say it. The less it sounds genuine, but I truly do mean that. Let's do it. All the things, all the buttons, do it. Hit them. Let's go. Discord link, click on it. If you want to learn about history, send you right over there. I'd love to have you pull up a chair. What I actually is Blitzkrieg? Let's go. June On June 22nd, sorry. 1941. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. German tanks, aircraft, artillery, and... On June 22nd, 1941, German tanks, aircraft, artillery, and men will tear into the Soviet Union. The military doctrine used by commanders is known to the world as Blitzkrieg, lightning war, and it will strike fear into the hearts of the Allies. But what is Blitzkrieg, and what makes it so special? Well, it's not actually anything that unique, and it shouldn't have really been such a surprise. That's true, sorry. I won't, I'll try not to pause so much, but th not that unique, because Blitzkrieg essentially is, what is it, lightning war? Isn't that what Blitz is, and Krieg is war? Lightning war, just really fast encirclements. And I think that we talk about Germans with Blitzkrieg, lightning war, is that they were, I, I guess, the first ones to really do it with, with tanks and armored divisions. Let me know if I'm wrong. I'm Indy Nidell. This is a World War II in real time special episode. Okay, let's get one thing out of the way first. Blitzkrieg has never been and will never be a coherent theory in German military doctrine. Before 1939, the word only appears twice in German military literature and only in the descriptive sense, literally referring to a lightning war rather than any method of warfare. In fact, it is only thanks to the British press that the word enters common usage. When Germany invades Poland with stunning success in September 1939, newspapers coin it to try and make sense of the shocking events that they are reporting. The idea of Blitzkrieg takes hold, and after the successful German invasion of France in June 1940, the Nazi propaganda machine uses it to celebrate German victories. But a lot of the Nazi leadership still seems to dismiss the idea, and Hitler will even refer to it as a completely idiotic word in November 1941. Plus, the Polish campaign can't really be considered a blitzkrieg campaign, and nor can the Battle of France. The battle for Poland not being really won by mobility, and the quick victory in France owed a lot to unauthorized initiative and daring planning. But this doesn't mean the word is entirely useless. It describes the German incarnation of the doctrine of combined maneuver warfare that became popular in the 1930s and influences all major players of the Second World War. It is all about deep penetrations into enemy lines conducted by armored formations supported by aircraft using the latest communications technology. But although Germany's so-called Blitzkrieg is the most famous use of this, it is not the sole part. Sorry, guys, I just I, I made this more kind of stable with putting these books, but I'm worried that like me breathing through my nose is going to. So let me give a little test. <laughs> Ugh, sorry. Eh, it's not bad. Sorry, sorry about that. So-called Blitzkrieg is the most famous use of this. It is not the sole pioneer. The First World War demonstrates the potential of mechanized warfare with the deployment of tanks from 1916 and the first basic use of combined arms at the Battle of Cambrai in 1917. But after the end of the war, financial realities and public disapproval for militarism mean that new military thinking is is pushed to the margins. Proponents of combined doctrines are seen as war-hungry mavericks. In France, Colonel Charles de Gaulle publishes his book Towards the Professional Army in 19... Sorry, you know he was like 6'5 or something crazy like that? He was a tall guy. 
In France, Colonel Charles de Gaulle publishes his book Towards the Professional Army in 1934. In it, he calls for a highly mobile modern force working closely with armored divisions and air support. If you'd like to get an idea of how controversial that makes de Gaulle, then watch our biography special about him. British military thinkers are also developing similar ideas. From the late 1920s, military strategist and historian Basil Liddell Hart begins calling for offensives led by fast-moving armored formations. His ideas are taken up by Percy Hobart, brigadier of Britain's first permanent armored brigade, who also pushes for similar tactics. The mostly conservative leadership of the British Army aren't all that receptive to the idea, though. They still think that infantry should lead offensives and that tanks should be used only in supporting roles. But two places where these new ideas are given room to flourish are Germany and the Soviet Union. There are few relevant military traditions for these countries to draw on. In Germany, the Treaty of Versailles has stripped its military to the bone. In the Soviet Union, communist revolution has swept away the old czarist army and replaced it with a completely new force. New realities have to be met with new tactics and new doctrine. In Germany, the commander-in-chief of the Reichswehr, Hans von Secht, trains officers in independence of action, making sure they understand the mission but decide for themselves how it should be achieved. He also structures exercises to promote mobility and maneuver and trains his forces in combined operations. This contributes to the Wehrmacht being the most flexible and effective army in the world at the start of the Second World War. See those war. little tanks? Von Secht retires already in 1926, but others continue his work. Oswald Lutz and Heinz Guderian are passionate about motorized and mobile warfare. Guderian even pays out of his own pocket to have Percy Hobart's works translated into German. Lutz is the senior of the two, and somewhat of a mentor. When he is promoted to command all tank forces in 1934, he gives Guderian command of the 2nd Panzer Division. Under Lutz's direction, Guderian begins writing a book to formalize the doctrines of armored forces. Achtung Panzer is published in 1937 and calls for new warfare waged by concentrated forces of tanks supported by infantry and air support. Doesn't Achtung mean attention in German? Concentrated forces of tanks supported by infantry and air support. And although there are critics, these I new methods of warfare wrong. are taking hold in high command. The concept of God, the vague of infantry sorry, and air up. support. And although there are critics, these new methods of warfare are taking hold in high command. The concept of Bewegungskrieg, or maneuver warfare, is already there in traditional German military doctrine, but it's now updated with all the potential that mechanized and industrial warfare has to offer. And there are parallel developments in the Soviet Union. Here, it is known as deep battle. The doctrine is even more developed than in Germany, although the Soviets lack the necessary industrial capacity to completely realize it. Deep battle is initially proposed by Alexander Svechin in the 1920s and elaborated by Mikhail Tukhachevsky in the 1930s. It envisions successive operations using speed and firepower to penetrate or flank the enemy's front and spread disorganization through rear areas. It does so with a mechanized army of tanks, mobile infantry, massed artillery, and aircraft. They attack deep into hostile territory, exploit gaps, and encircle enemy troops. By the eve of the Second World War, theories of deep battle and modern Bewegungskrieg have come to more or less the same conclusions about mobile warfare. We can summarize them in the following tenets. Surprise and deception. Concentration of force. Clearly defined mission objectives. Operational maneuver. Shock and mobility. Integration of air power for reconnaissance and point attacks. Effective communication between all elements. Logistics. Both the Wehrmacht sense. and Red Army consider all these tenets to be essential, albeit in differing degrees. The Wehrmacht rely more on independence of action, whereas the Soviets prefer stricter adherence to planning. And there are differences between deep battle and Blitzkrieg. Blitzkrieg breaks through at single points and exploits that to the end, while the deep battle relies on massive use of force at various points on a wider front. Blitzkrieg relies- Sorry, so I said I wouldn't pause, but the obvious drawbacks of each of those, and I think the German way, I think, is more of the American way today, and I think to be slightly better, as long as you have good generals 
doing it. Obviously, you can't just have basic infantry making basic decisions on the fly. Or not basic decisions, big decisions on the fly. So the Soviet plan, yeah, it makes it so that, you know, your underlings don't make stupid mistakes and that your plan is followed through. But then if something out of the ordinary and spontaneous happens, then they don't really know what to do. They don't know if they can have the authority to change the plan. And the opposite goes for the uh, the other way. Relies, relies on massive use of force at various points on a wider front. Blitzkrieg relies on tactical flexibility and deep battle on large-scale preparation and deception. But they ultimately achieve the same outcome. Differences aside, both these military doctrines are just waiting to be put to use. Now, if you've been following the series, you'll already have a pretty good idea of how they look in practice. I'll get to that in a minute, but the first real trial actually comes before the Second World War, although I talked about it in our very first episode. The Soviets and Japanese and their respective client states, the Mongolian People's Republic and Manchukuo, have been having a series of border conflicts throughout most of the 1930s. From May 1939, fresh fighting begins around the river Kalkin Gol. By June the so 39, Japanese troops creeping in front of the Soviet tanks. I, I'll tell you, if the Japan, Imperial Japanese soldiers are nuts, were nuts. If you were to ask me, you know, you had to go back in time and you either had to storm the beaches of Normandy or storm um, Iwo Jima, Okinawa or something like that. Or, you know, you have to either fight in Europe, the European theater or the Asia Pacific theater. Give me European theater. A hundred times out of a hundred, 99 times out of a hundred. Border conflicts throughout most of the 1930s. From May 1939, fresh fighting begins around the river Kalkin Gol. By June, the Soviets, they're on the back foot. Stalin sends in rising star Georgi Zhukov to salvage the situation. Following Stalin's approval of his plan, Zhukov requests three rifle divisions, a tank brigade, artillery, and aircraft. The Soviets launched their offensive on August 20th, following the principles of deep battle rigorously. To create deception, vehicle engines are kept continually running to mask troop movements. Logistics are meticulously planned, with 1,500 trucks transporting supplies across 650 kilometers. And air power is prioritized, with 200 aircraft providing close support. The objective is to doubly envelop Japanese forces, primarily with tanks, and it works. Within four days, much of the Japanese army is surrounded. By August 30th, it is mostly destroyed. Japanese sources acknowledge the loss of 18,000 men and 149 aircraft. So deep battle has proved itself. But what about in Germany? Well, as I said at the start, Blitzkrieg is not actually a coherent doctrine. But the military is experimenting with new combined operations. They prove pretty effective in the invasion of Poland, which sees some aspects of a modern Bewegungskrieg. But the campaign also sticks to more traditional methods of warfare. Panzers are not given the penetration role or independence of action theorists such as Guderian call for. But high command definitely has a more defined military doctrine with the invasion of France. I already covered that in depth last year, but it is almost a textbook example of Bewegungskrieg. Deception is achieved with Army Group B acting as the Matador's cape, holding Allied attention away from the sickle stroke of Army Group A. Logistics, communications, and air power are prioritized, with advancing troops never having to wait more than 15 minutes for air support. On the ground, the emphasis on maneuverability and shock tactics means that the often inferior German tanks are still able to defeat their French counterparts. The outcome is precisely what Bewegungskrieg sets out to achieve. The Allied armies are trapped in position and encircled by Panzer divisions. There is much debate over whether the Battle of France can be considered a Blitzkrieg campaign. I'm not going to get into it here, but the general argument is that there was no grand strategic plan for such a decisive victory. It was more the result of improvisation, luck, and the action. Okay, so I'm learning something here. I thought the Battle for France was the example of Blitzkrieg, but clearly uh, I was wrong. ...of individual officers on the ground. I will let you guys fight it out in the comments, but whatever you want to call it, Blitzkrieg has sent shockwaves through the world. 
Allied leaders use it to explain their failures, claiming they were caught entirely off guard. They're not exactly wrong, but should they have really been so surprised? They had hints that the game had changed with Kalkin Gol, the Polish campaign, and even the Spanish Civil War. And they had military minds in their own countries calling for them to be ready for this new style of warfare. But Germany is flushed with success, and Adolf Hitler will soon begin the biggest test of Blitzkrieg yet. The USSR is vast, and the Soviets have the first-hand experience of how successful modern maneuver warfare can be. The invasion will kickstart the largest and most destructive campaign the world has ever seen, with two juggernauts battling it out with combined forces of aircraft, artillery, tanks, mechanized infantry, and more. That is it for today. But if you want to learn more about Kalk and Gaul, then check out our final Between Two Wars episode just before the beginning of World War II right here. And make sure to subscribe so you never, ever, 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 ever miss a single one of our fantastic videos. See you next time. See you guys next time. Awesome. I mean, I always say hindsight is twenty twenty. We need to take that into account when learning about history. And so just saying a few Allied commanders knew of these tactics, I don't think is necessarily the best means of criticism for allies being taken off guard in the Battle of France. But I can acknowledge I, I can very possibly be wrong and uh, new information, I'll change my opinion. Awesome. That's my recommended video of the day here. I'm gonna do, I think one more video today and then call it quits. And we'll get back to uh, more Hannibal videos we will finish up the last two episodes of the Irish Potato Famine from Extra Credits, Extra History, and uh, see what to do next. See you guys next time.